The Night Beat starts right now. A busy weekend here in San Antonio from spring break travelers to families coming to watch the NCAA Women's Tournament, which kicked off today. A definitely a stark difference from just a year ago when most of the nation was beginning COVID-19 pandemic shutdown. Yeah, the night team's Jonathan Cotto took to the city's downtown streets to tell us how the tournament and recent removal of restrictions are changing the vibe of downtown. This time last year, San Antonio was just two days into the declared public health emergency issued by Governor Greg Abbott. With COVID and we were out of, you know, out of work for a little while, but now that we're back and we're up and things are starting to normalize a little bit. This weekend, downtown San Antonio is filled with people, not only from spring breakers. We're here for the NCAA tournament and our daughter plays for the Gonzaga Bulldogs out of Spokane, Washington. Fans coming in from all over the country for the two week long NCAA women's basketball tournament, adding more customers for local businesses. Spring break just passed and was very busy. We were all over, packed. And this is the first weekend everything in Texas is open 100% after the governor lifted restrictions for businesses, including the mask mandate. You can't force anybody to do it, but we do recommend it. And unless they're sitting down and eating, then we like to have their, keep their mask on. A different sight for some out of state visitors. It's been really nice. People have a choice if they want to wear a mask, which is great. In Washington, we're pretty much shut down still. But as excited as some tourists are about not wearing a mask, others still choosing the side of caution. I didn't have any very much negative feedback, but there was a lot of people that were like, oh, I'm still going to wear my mask. The weekend festivities showing San Antonio is one step closer to bouncing back as a tourist destination. I've never been here before. The river walks wonderful and very friendly people. And it's, it's really nice, really nice. Tim Courtney, the majority of the games will be played at the Alamo at the Alamo Dome and the final championship game is scheduled for April 4th. Reporting Jonathan Cotto, back to you. Thank you, Jonathan. San Antonio police need your help identifying three suspects in a murder case. SAPD identified the victim as 39 year old Tito Roman. Take a look at the surveillance footage on your screen now released from the shooting on Wednesday at the Home Suites Motel off Northwest Loop 410. That's where police found Roman dead with a gunshot wound. SAPD believes he was shot by the two men in this video. Moments later, the suspect, the suspects, both of them, along with the woman, are seen leaving in a red truck. Anyone with information is asked to call homicide detectives at the number on your screen, 210-207-7635. Tonight, a 19-year-old man facing murder charges after leading Bear County deputies on a chase. That chase ended in a crash that killed a woman, resulting in the charges against Esteban Zamaripa. The night team's Jaffney Gray shows us what happened. What could have been simply an evading charge is now that and a murder charge for 19-year-old Esteban Samaripa III. This after Bear County Sheriff's deputies say he led them on a short chase that ended with a crash and a woman's death. Deputies say they saw him driving a gray Ford Focus recklessly after 1:15 Sunday morning near Walsham and Terrassa Drive. They tried to stop Samaripa after he hit several curves and then took off. Deputies say they pursued him as he ran through traffic lights and drove in the wrong direction. BCSO says eventually Samaripa crashed into a truck and a Toyota Camry at the intersection of Riddiman Road and Frat. That's less than 10 minutes down the road from where the pursuit started. Deputies say the woman driving the car Samaripa hit died at the scene. One witness who asked not to be identified said he was shocked by the aftermath. I took him out for a walk and I was like, I, I seen when I was taking him out, I seen all these lights. The driver of the truck survived. Medical examiner says the dead woman not yet ID'd, but she was 49 years old. I felt really bad about, you know, what happened. Samaripa is in the Bear County Sheriff's Office or in jail right now, facing charges of evading arrest and murder. In total, his bond has been set at about $110,000. Now, a spokesperson with BCSO did say that they're looking into whether or not Samaripa was under the influence of narcotics at the time of his arrest. Of course, all of this is under investigation, and we'll be sure to bring you those updates when they become available. For now, Daphne Gray, KSAT 12 News.
Thank you, Jaffney. A Von Ormy family is mourning the loss of their toddler who was killed in a crash that Bear County deputies are calling an accident. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office identified the two-year-old as Itzel Garcia Hernandez. The incident happened just after 11 last night at the home in the 44,000 block of Throne in Von Ormy. BCSO deputies say a family member was backing out of the driveway and didn't see Garcia Hernandez and ran her over. She was pronounced dead at the scene. A driver is dead following a two vehicle crash on the far northeast side today. That crash happened around 3 p.m. at Perrin Bidal Road and Thousand Oaks Drive. San Antonio police say a car was pulling out onto Thousand Oaks when they pulled into the path of a pickup truck. That truck hitting the car, killing the car's driver. The truck driver was injured and taken to the hospital in stable condition. So far, that victim not identified. Several units in an apartment complex are damaged following a fire this afternoon on the northwest side. The fire broke out around 2.30 at the complex off Danny K. It took fire crews around 20 minutes to get the fire under control when they got to the scene. Fire officials say four units are damaged from either smoke or water. They believe the fire started on the balcony of one of the units, but the exact cause is still under investigation tonight. No injuries were reported. A teen facing charges after BCSO deputies say he was driving on front yards doing donuts in West Bear County. 18 year old Abel Mascoro was arrested today after deputies tried to pull him over for a traffic stop. At some point during the chase, Mascoro's two front tires blew out. He's now facing several charges, including a felony charge of evading arrest with a motor vehicle. No one was injured during the incident. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has yet to identify a motorcyclist who died during a crash on the northeast side today. The crash happened on FM 78. San Antonio police say a car was pulling out of a parking lot when the motorcyclist T-boned the car. Police believe both drivers did not see each other and ruled the crash an accident. Witnesses say the man was not wearing a helmet at the time of the crash. The car driver was uninjured. An attempted robbery ending with one man being shot near the Pearl Brewery this morning. That incident happened around 12:30 on Newell Street near Pearl Parkway and Avenue B. The victim told the police that the suspect pulled up at a vehicle and demanded his belongings when the victim refused. That's when police say the suspect shot him and drove off. The victim was shot in the upper body and was taken to Bamsey in stable condition. Police used their Eagle helicopter to search the area, but came up empty handed. Tonight, Metro Health is reporting 193 new cases locally. That brings the confirmed total number of cases to 202,550. Right now, the seven day moving average is 174 cases per 24 hours. Thankfully, no new deaths to report. But those totals released tonight also include 665 backlog cases and 74 deaths that date back to December. The death toll now at 3,071. As far as the hospitalization rate tonight, 188 people remain in the hospital with 76 in the ICU and 45 on ventilators. Well, since last week, we've been asking for your questions about pregnancy during the pandemic, and you've had some great responses, so we're getting you those answers. Earlier this week, I spoke to a local maternal fetal medicine director about vaccines. That's the topic you brought up the most. Wednesday, we compared available vaccines, and now we're talking about what protections the vaccine may be able to give to your baby. Doctors and researchers around the world are now strongly recommending pregnant women get the COVID-19 vaccine as soon as possible. We've seen 10,000 plus women be, who are pregnant been immunized with the Pfizer Moderna vaccines at this point and have not seen any significant pregnancy complications related to it. And we do know that COVID-19 carries significant risk to mom. And, and if mom doesn't do well, baby, uh, that the vaccine is clearly uh, the right answer. Dr. Patrick Ramsey is the maternal fetal medicine director working at both University Hospital and UT Health San Antonio. Can the vaccine protect the baby from COVID-19? Based on what we know from other vaccines, the flu vaccine, uh, the, the, the uh, pertussis vaccine, uh, when mom develops an immune response, uh, one of the antibodies they make is called an IgG type antibody, and those antibodies cross into the, through the placenta into the baby. So there is strong evidence from these other vaccines that that antibody uh, response will go into the baby and give baby some protection. What they don't know yet is how long that immune protection might last. 
we just don't know how long the antibodies last in general in the general population and then pregnancy we're not certain if that's going to have an impact on how long those antibodies last and how long will there be sustainable levels in the baby uh, during the pregnancy luckily he says those answers may not be too far away I think the big study that's being done through Pfizer and likely through some of the other uh, companies uh, in pregnant women will give us some of those insights because they are looking at cord levels and levels of antibodies in the baby out to several months. And we have a lot more of your questions we're working to answer about vaccines, breastfeeding, delivery protocols, and infertility all amid the pandemic. I'm setting up more stories with experts right as we speak. If you want to ask us your own question, find the story on ksat.com and scroll to the bottom of the page. Here's a look outside with our live cam. We actually have some mid and high clouds streaming overhead. Hard to see here now that the sun has set, but they did make for a pretty good sunset. And I'll have that time lapse for you coming up in a few minutes. What a day today. What a weekend in general. Great weekend to be outside and really savor the lack of humidity, the comfortable temperatures, because we know we're just weeks to maybe just a month away of the warmer air really taking hold. Today we started the day at 45. Then we topped out at 74 for the high in San Antonio, Carrizo Springs, Del Rio, 81 and Catula even made it up to 84 degrees. That's all with low humidity tomorrow morning. Low clouds, not as cool as the past couple of mornings will be in the mid 50s, about 54 to start your day with the clouds and a noticeable breeze out of the southeast as well. Rain chances right around the corner. I'm going to start off with those in a few minutes. The museum is celebrating students with dyslexia. We speak with a local girl featured in the exhibit who says she's not bothered by her diagnosis. Plus, our coverage of migrants at the border continues. Right now, more than 15,000 unaccompanied minors are in U.S. custody. We have the latest on how Health and Human Services is planning to house those minors. And with nearly two and a half million shots a day, can the vaccine keep up as dozens of states see cases increase? Why one city had to issue a curfew this weekend. Next. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. With millions of Americans now vaccinated, many are on the move once again. The TSA screened nearly a million and a half travelers on Friday, many of them heading to Miami Beach. The city fo was forced to impose a curfew to deal with those massive crowds. Here's ABC's Kenneth Moten with the details. Miami Beach city leaders extending a state of emergency and a curfew in response to big spring break crowds. Saturday night, streets were filled with spring break partiers to find the 8 p.m. curfew as it went into effect. <laughs> SWAT teams moving in, shooting pepper balls to break up the mostly maskless crowd. Florida reporting nearly 4,000 new COVID-19 infections Sunday. The state leading the nation with the most cases of the highly contagious UK and Brazilian variants. According to an internal HHS planning document obtained by ABC News, Miami had the highest positivity rate of any major metropolitan area in the U.S. Miami Beach leaders now extending their city's curfew through mid-April. I think there are very few places that are uh, open uh, as, as we have been open. We are attracting all sorts of folks from all over the country. Cases are on the rise in 15 states. Michigan has seen a 92% increase in cases over the last two weeks. We could potentially be at the beginning of another surge in Michigan. Meantime, Texas Governor Greg Abbott tweeting that his state's seven-day COVID positivity rate has dropped to its lowest level since May 2020. Vaccination efforts are continuing across the country. The nation now averaging nearly two and a half million daily shots into arms. I take care of my 98-year-old blind grandfather, so kind of important to get vaccinated as soon as possible. More than 124 million vaccines have now been administered across the U.S. More than 81 million Americans have received at least one dose and more than 44 million have been fully vaccinated. Yet some people are still hesitant to get the shot. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is calling on the CDC to take action. Launch a campaign that educates, reaches out, and shows people why they should be taking the vaccine. Health officials say the vaccine is still the best defense against the virus. Kenneth Moten, ABC News, New York.
<laughs> Back here at home, we've really been stringing together a bunch of nice spring yeah. days. The only downside is all the spring pollen. And poor Tim with this yes. oak. It's already happening. It's the only one that bothers me yeah. is the oak. I was wheezing through a couple of those stories earlier in the newscast. And you know, oak is low today. We will have your pollen count coming up momentarily. Oak is low today, but it's on the rise. So yeah. get ready for it uh, to continue to climb and it's going to spike soon. You can already see the little catkins starting to grow on the trees and before you know it will be in full swing with oak season. So you've been warned and here's another sign of fall. Spring has sprung. This is Stockdale looking at the nice yellow spring field. Uh, let's head to Burton, Texas. Of course, you got to get the shot. The kids with the, the blue bonnets and Here's a couple that are celebrating their first blue bonnet of the season so far. All right, it's that time of year. We like to see it. We could use some rain, though. It'd be nice to give a fresh watering to all those wildflowers out there. You look across the state. We have some mid and high clouds that are coming in from the west, and that's what we had at sunset. If you were outside at sunset, you noticed a nice, a nice sunset because of those high clouds. Gave us a little bit of color with that low angle sun. This is all part of a broader system, all ahead of a broader system that's causing more mountain snowfall throughout Utah and especially into Colorado as well. This dip in the upper level flow, that's what's stirring things up. That dip, that disturbance, that's going to pass just north of San Antonio, but it's going to drop into Texas and it's going to bring parts of Texas some much needed rainfall. Notice I'm not really emphasizing South Texas here, unfortunately. I think we'll get clipped by some, but not as much as our friends to the north. Here's our future cast. Cloudy gray day tomorrow. First thing in the morning, we'll have the clouds. Some showers far north of us in the morning, even by the noon hour, closer to San Angelo, Waco, Dallas area, and northward up I-35. By tomorrow, late afternoon and evening, we're looking at the chance of a few popping up around here, a few showers and brief thunderstorms. But don't get your hopes too high because we're not expecting anything too widespread and we're not expecting a lot in terms of accumulation. So you see 7 p.m. here. This com computer is saying, oh, hey, about Pipe Creek area, Bandera County up towards Sister Day on Comfort. Don't pay close attention to the exact placement of these predicted cells. Really, it's just the fact that this computer model's developing them and popping up a few showers and storms. It could really happen pretty much anywhere across South Texas. But again, it's going to be widely separated, fairly isolated in nature. We'll take what we can get, though. This is the latest drought monitor. Nearly 70% of Texas is considered in drought right now. And especially if you get south of San Antonio, that's where we have the most extreme an exceptional drought, Catula, all the way down into Webb County and Laredo area. So we need rain. Other parts of Texas do too. And I do think with this pattern this week, other parts of the state will really cash in and get some decent rainfall around here. 30% chance late Monday, another 30% chance of a few storms on Wednesday, and then even lesser chance on Thursday. I mentioned those high clouds. Here they are streaming in tonight, made for a nice sunset, got a little bit of color off the base of those clouds. 45 in the morning, 74 for the high temperature. So we were below average, especially in the morning. We had some unseasonably cool mornings, but that's coming to an end tomorrow. We're at 64 right now, and we'll drop about another 10 degrees by tomorrow morning. 64 Rio Medina, 60 in comfort, pretty similar temperatures. Randolph at 62, New Braunfels and Canyon Lake both at 63. Del Rio a little bit warmer, still at 75, and Carrizo Springs 70. Not overly humid, but the southeasterly wind is increasing our moisture content a little bit. You're not going to really notice it and it's not going to be muggy, but that added moisture is going to lead to the low clouds tomorrow morning. So a cloudy start to the day and we'll squeeze in a few peaks of sunshine by the afternoon, but don't expect much breezy southeasterly wind at 10 to 20 near 70 for the high temperature. So a comfortable afternoon again. It's just not going to be as pretty outside and we'll have the low gray clouds in place and the off chance of a few of those showers and thunderstorms late in the day. Tuesday, it's back to sunshine right near 80 degrees. And one thing I want to point out is that our dew points and the humidity, it's going to be yo-yoing up and down all week long. One day it'll feel humid, the next it won't back and forth. That sounds like South Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Adam. We'll have a preview of instant replay right after this. Our San Antonio Spurs return home from their most difficult road trip of the season with a winning record and now tip off a significant homestand starting tomorrow. With more of what's on tonight's instant replay, let's check in with our Greg Simmons. And this, Good to see the boys back home. Yeah, it's, and it's the longest homestand I can remember the Spurs ever having in their entire career. And the Texas Longhorns are stunned in the first round while the Baylor Bears defend their number one seed in March Madness. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay.
Every game is needed, every game counts. And, uh, in order to press in the best position to uh, be in a great spot in the playoffs. All right, our San Antonio Spurs returned home for playing five games in seven nights that began and ended with losses, but in the middle, winning three games in a row. Now they're back home for a nine-game homestand. Let's watch Lamelo. Right there is where he landed. She grabbed the wrist immediately. No, oh, that's not good. That nine-game homestand tips off tomorrow against the Charlotte Hornets. We'll have the Hornets have their best player on the floor, LaMelo Ball. We've got the injury details with our segment called Know Your Foe. And this nine-game homestand also includes back-to-back -back games against the Clippers, whose Spurs have already defeated on the road in the first half of the season. The job's not finished. Um, we're just going to keep playing hard and try to take one game at a time. The Baylor Bears are headed to the Sweet 16 after they successfully defended their number one seed today against number nine, Wisconsin. But at the same time, the Texas Longhorns were upset late last night by 14 seeded Abilene Christian. We'll show you how that happened. And that all leads us to tonight's poll question. Should Texas fire Shaka Smart tonight? You decide. Instant replay is live and is after the night beat. Another hot seat in Austin. Yeah, it's been, he's been on that hot seat more than once. Yes, you're right. Thank you, Greg. Mm -hmm. All right, next on the night beat, it may be a learning disorder, but it is definitely not slowing down this 11-year-old, how this local girl is handling her dyslexia. And the first accuser against New York Governor Andrew Cuomo is calling for impeachment. But the governor continues to say about the situation. But next, why the Biden administration is claiming to have inherited a broken system when it comes to the increase of migrants at the border. More than 15,000 unaccompanied minors are now in U.S. custody after crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. Immigration authorities are struggling to find safe, acceptable housing for all of them. And the Biden administration facing growing criticism, some blaming his administration's early messaging. But that message now seems to be changing. Here's ABC's Mary Alice Parks with the details. The White House facing mounting criticism for the humanitarian crisis at the U.S. border with Mexico. Data obtained by ABC News showing there are now more than 5,000 unaccompanied children and teens in the custody of Customs and Border Protection. Over 800 of those children have been in custody for more than 10 days. The legal limit is three. What it looks like are children standing up with nowhere to sit down, children who can't all lay down at the same time or can't lay down at all. Um, there were babies who hadn't crawled in weeks because there was nowhere for mothers to put them down. The Biden administration ended former President Trump's so-called remain in Mexico policy, requiring asylum seekers to wait in Mexico for their court proceedings. Now Republicans argue that change has contributed to the surge in migrants arriving at the border. The messaging is that if you want to come, you can stay. When Mallorca says we're not saying don't come at all, just don't come now. Very irresponsible rhetoric for a Secretary of Homeland Security to say. It. The last few days, the White House striking a far more firm tone. Do not come. Uh, the border is closed. The border is secure. We are expelling uh, families. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas arguing the Biden administration inherited a broken system. They are now working to rebuild. White House sources also saying they are looking specifically to reopen shelters the Trump administration let lag. The entire system uh, under United States law that has been in place throughout administrations of both parties was dismantled in its entirety by the Trump administration. Ruben Garcia is the director of Annunciation House, one of the largest migrant shelters in the U.S. I believe that we are going to see a surge that will probably surpass what we saw in 2018, 2019. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, Washington. Meanwhile, the Texas Department of Health and Human Services is opening an additional influx shelter in Pecos, Texas, that will provide housing for migrant children as they wait for a sponsor. And Immigration and Customs Enforcement has signed a contract with the nonprofit Endeavors to create more facilities to house migrant families. A Dallas artist is welcoming the 1,200 migrant children being housed at the Dallas Convention Center. Artist Roberto Marquez finished up a mural that you see here on Saturday. He came across the border himself 40 years ago and wanted the colorful mural to capture the drama of their journey. The K. Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center is now serving as a new emergency intake site for children who have crossed the border without their parents. 
The first woman to accuse New York Governor Andrew Cuomo of sexual misconduct now calling for his impeachment. During a rally in New York City, the accuser, the accuser Lindsay Boylan, says she wants a transparent process. The former aide claims Cuomo repeatedly sexually harassed her, allegedly kissing her without warning on one occasion inside his Manhattan office. Now she says Cuomo and his staff have tried to retaliate against her for sharing her story. Someone who abuses their power doesn't just do it to one woman or one community. They do it on some level to every person and every community. Despite the majority of the state lawmakers urging Cuomo to step down, he has sternly refused to resign, instead asking the public to wait for the results of the investigations that are ongoing. New York Attorney General Letitia James, who is leading one of those investigations, has been tight-lipped so far. So the investigation is ongoing. Um, we're still interviewing witnesses, and there's not much more to report other than that. Cuomo has denied any sexual misconduct or harassment, though he's acknowledged he may have made others uncomfortable unintentionally. Meanwhile, today, residents in Brooklyn remembering the more than 15,000 nursing home residents who died there from COVID-19. Grieving family members at the event said the memorial was also to address what they believe are the lies and dismissiveness of Governor Cuomo's administration. He and his aides have denied withholding or lying about the number of nursing home deaths during the pandemic. The outer fencing surrounding the U.S. Capitol following the January 6th insurrection started coming down this weekend. Take a look. For the first time in nearly three months, joggers, bicyclists and tourists are once again able to use some of that green space in front of the Capitol. National Guardsmen began the removal process this weekend and by today, much of the black fencing had been taken down. Some of the streets around the Capitol complex have also reopened to traffic this weekend. A memo sent to Capitol staff says the changes are being made because there is no longer a credible threat against Congress. All right, what's the most you would pay for a cup of coffee? Five dollars. I would not pay five dollars, but one woman in Colorado paid five thousand seven hundred five dollars and seventy cents. She was charged that much back on Christmas Eve at the Gaylord Hotel. She believes the employee typed in 570 twice, and her records show the Gaylord admitted the mistake in January. But after being credited from the money back from her bank, USAA, they took it away again, claiming that it never that they never got the payment back from the hotel. After two months of dealing with the issues, she's reaching out to her local news station to contact USAA on her behalf. Within a few hours, she got her money back. Some cup of coffee. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it wasn't worth it. <laughs> no, it, it wasn't. It was 10 cents for a cup of coffee. No, nah, what a headache. <laughs> All right, look at outside. Beautiful skyline. Don't you love downtown San Antonio this time of year? It's not overly humid outside. It was just another beautiful crisp day. It's a little breezy though. You notice the wind out there right now. I mean, we're gusting up to 30 miles per hour in parts of South Texas. Creaso Springs, for example, most recent gusts up to 30. Hondo gusting to 28. Bit of a breeze right now and it's coming out of the southeast and you're going to be noticing it through the day tomorrow. Right now we're 69 in Catula, New Braunfels 63, Kerrville 61, San Antonio at 64. You look closer and temperatures are pretty similar. At 63 Canyon Lake and Bulverde to 66 in Hondo and Tarpley at 64. So tomorrow morning, not as cool of a morning. We've been down in the lower 40s. We'll be in the low to mid 50s tomorrow morning and then a comfortable 70 degrees by the afternoon. More on our rain chances coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on the night beat. Three family friendly cartoons are going head to head for the top spot at the box office. So who topped out? And next, the museum is celebrating dyslexic learners. Meet the young student feature in their latest exhibit. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Well, being diagnosed with a learning disorder may lead some people to believe they'll have a harder time learning and achieving things. But a new exhibit at the museum proves all that wrong. Tiffany Huertas introduces us to a local student featured in the exhibit and tells us how she's not letting dyslexia slow her down. I was taking out the trash of the bushes chicken and out and this is very Pacific, okay? Um, Specific. Pacific, I'm sorry. Dyslexia. Um. <laughs> 11 year old Addison Schaefer says she'll never forget the day she found out she was dyslexic. And everyone thinks it's such a big deal. 
It's just dyslexia. Dyslexia is a learning disorder that affects a person's ability to read, spell, write, and sometimes speak. But it doesn't really mean to like you see letters backwards. It just like means that you need more help in school. Addison was diagnosed in the third grade and it's affected her in the classroom. I have to go to different classes on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. And every time I take a test, I have to have someone read it to me or the computer read it to me. But having dyslexia also gave Addison a great opportunity to be featured in a traveling exhibit at the museum. Beautiful Minds, Dyslexia, and the Creative Advantage was created by the Oklahoma Science Center. Meredith Doby, the vice president of exhibits at the museum, says the goal is to celebrate those with dyslexia. It's looking at the ways that dyslexia uh, can be an advantage, that it creates outside-the-box thinkers, and it um, showcases some local people um, who have been diagnosed with dyslexia, talks about their stories. We went to the studio, we took some pictures, and then we voiced, we did a voice recording of like, like with this microphone, and then that eventually got into the museum. Hi, my name is Addison Schaefer, and I'm nine years old, and I am first grade. Connie Schaefer, Addison's mom, is a reading specialist who works with dyslexic students at Northside ISD. Connie says she knew the challenges her daughter would face, but also knows it won't hold her back. It's just her brain works differently, and we know that she's super creative, and she loves to draw and paint and dance, and um, she's got so many other strengths that she just needed a little bit of help in reading. Addison says she's not worried either. I think it's because I got the, the we found out I was dyslexic at the right time, and I wasn't an adult, like in college. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Looks like she is doing just great. Dozens of dyslexic students in the area also got to submit artwork for the traveling exhibit. Beautiful Minds, Dyslexia, and the Creative Advantage will be at the museum until March 28th. We'll be right back. All right, I got to do this one in my Bob D Dylan voice. Seasons, they are a-changing <laughs> on Saturn. <laughs> That's a terrible Bob Dylan. <laughs> NASA astronomers are now getting a more detailed look at the planet's wide and active atmosphere in these new pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. A new series of images taken in the last three years documents the changes as Saturn's northern hemisphere moves from summer to fall. Cloud height and winds could be the reason for slight year-to-year -year changes in color. Each Saturn season represents more than seven Earth years. I think you did pretty good. It was terrible. Better than mine would have been. Terrible. <laughs> I'm not even trying. I give you an 8.5. Yeah. It was it was good. I mean, that was pretty high. <laughs> I'm generous Very with my generous. grading. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got some changes ahead for us. Uh, tomorrow morning's not going to be quite as cool as the past couple of mornings. We'll start the day in the mid 50s and then rise to near 70 for the high. But you look at our overall headlines and we have some rain chances coming our way. A gray day tomorrow and breezy. I want to talk more about rain chances and just rain in general. Let's start with this. Take a look at our percent of normal precipitation for the past 30 days. So if it was 100%, well, then we would have had our average or normal precipitation, but we're far below that. Even Hondo Castroville, 1% of their normal 30 day precipitation. So not a uh, not the nicest picture to see. Sorry, I'm not trying to depress you here on this Sunday evening, but we uh, it's clear we obviously need rainfall and you look at the drought monitor as a whole and I mentioned Northern Bear County considered in a severe drought. And then you get down to Catula southward into Webb County and we have the extreme and exceptional drought across the state. Almost 70% of the state is considered in drought. Compare that to three months ago. And it's actually a better situation than three months ago when 78% was of the state was in drought. But we have some rain coming our way, at least a little bit here. Better chances north of us in Texas. Let's talk about it. We've got some clouds coming off the Pacific, going over Mexico, now working their way into Texas. That gave us some of those high clouds this evening and tonight. And we've got widespread precipitation in the mountains, even snowfall, higher elevation snowfall again. This has been good for the ski resorts from Utah to Colorado. This is all part of the same broad upper level disturbance, this dip in the upper level flow. That's going to be heading toward us, but the main energy of it is going to be to the north of San Antonio. So here's our future cast for this and West Texas getting a few showers late tonight, early tomorrow morning. Some folks far north of us 
especially into Oklahoma. By the noon hour tomorrow, most of the action should be San Angelo to about Dallas up to Oklahoma City and into Kansas. And then we get into tomorrow afternoon and evening and a few, just a few pop up showers and storms could develop for us here in South Texas. Hit or miss in nature. And unfortunately, most of us, I think, will remain dry, but I do think some isolated locations will get some of these brief storms. So don't just pay very close attention to the exact location and placement of the computer's rendition of where it's going to rain. Just the mere fact that it's showing some showers and storms popping up here tomorrow evening and into the early nighttime hours. As for rainfall potential, this is all the way through Wednesday because we get a shot at rain tomorrow evening. And then again on Wednesday, we could see some isolated storms. So our potential, it's not that high, not that significant around here, but better news for folks to the north, right? If we're not going to get it, at least somebody else's Waco up to Dallas and then up into Oklahoma as well. Right now we're at 64 degrees, but what you notice outside is that wind. It's out of the southeast at 18. And despite coming off the Gulf of Mexico, we're still not muggy outside at dew point of 46. Dewey's are down in the 40s right now. Feels great. Of course, 50s a little bit higher, closer to the Gulf coastline. And as you look forward over the next five to seven days, it's our dew points are just going to yo yo up and down, up and down, up and down. You see, we'll notice the humidity in the air Wednesday and Thursday, then it gets swept away. Then again, into the weekend on Sunday, you'll notice it. So there will be some sporadic periods of uh, high humidity, or as some of the ladies like to say, bad hair days mixed in. I don't have enough to really relate, but happens when you get hit 40 and you have three kids, right? Anyway, cloudy day tomorrow, 54 to start, 70 degrees the high temperature, and then those isolated pop-up showers and storms tomorrow evening. We're not expecting anything too widespread. Tuesday, a sunny day, then Wednesday, as I mentioned, another shot at some rain, so cross your fingers for your neighborhood. And overall temperatures, look at those highs. Other than tomorrow, 70s to right near 80. We rate your hair a solid 10. <laughs> <laughs> Those kids also make it turn white, too. All right, coming I up noticed. next, uh, Disney's latest offering. How did it do at the box office? Find out. That's not good. The Crudes, A New Age, is still in the top five after nearly four months in theaters. The animated sequel made $620,000. If you want to protect the girls, you have to leave now. Chaos Walking ambled down to fourth place, earning $1.9 million. Sounds like work. No, tell them I'm in my chair. Yes, he's just walked in. The Courier was the weekend's top new movie. The Cold War spy drama starring Benedict Cumberbatch opened in third place with two million dollars. Cause that's what friends are supposed to do, oh yeah. Tom and Jerry took second with 3.8 million dollars for a domestic total of 33.7 million. Hey, baby. Where are your parents? Hey, uh, who's baby? What? Raya and the Last Dragon ruled the box office for a third straight weekend. $5.2 million gave the animated adventure 23.4 million domestic in 17 days. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. All right, the women's NCAA tournament tipped off today here in San Antonio and the surrounding area. Yeah, but not without controversy before the games began. With more on what's an instant replay tonight, let's head over to Greg. Yeah, to say the least, that was a little embarrassing yes. for that nationwide exposure. And Houston, Texas quarterback Deshaun Watson under fire with 12 lawsuits, maybe more to come tomorrow. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. We want to get out hot. We want to start out hot and uh, fast, and that's how we get momentum. That's how we get uh, into the flow of things. The number two seeded Bailey Bear has helped tip off the women's NCAA basketball tournament here in San Antonio and the surrounding area today, live right here on KSAT 12. But well, the tournament does not get off to a good start after a disparity in the men's tournament weight room and the women's tournament weight room was exposed here in the Alamo City. Who is to blame? Our intention is to put together a package and to submit it to the police department. 
And Houston Texans quarterback Deshaun Watson is under fire after a total of seven lawsuits have been filed alleging sexual misconduct. Another five could be filed by as early as tomorrow, bringing the total number to 12. And should as many as 60,000 fans be allowed inside AT&T Stadium next month to watch Canelo Alvarez's latest fight? The sports guys are back tonight with all the answers. And who is our latest scholar athlete? Tonight you will find out. Instant Replay is live, and it is next. Another jam-packed show. We'll get it all in. All right, thank you, Greg. <laughs> sure. We'll see you in just a bit. We'll be right back. That's going to do it for us, for all of us here at KSAT 12. Thanks so much for watching. And the Good Morning San Antonio crew will be in with all your latest overnight news beginning at 4.30. And all new instant replay starts right now. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a brand new edition of Instant Replay. And welcome to all those in San Antonio for the start of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. Despite the rocky start, more on that in just a moment, on San Antonio Spurs have returned home after going 3-2 and two in their most difficult road trip of the season so far. And what made it so impressive is that the Spurs were able to get two of those three wins without DeMar DeRozan, who had returned to California to comfort his family following the death of his father, and LaMarcus Aldridge, who is no longer with the team as the Spurs attempt to work out a trade before Thursday's deadline. He started with a blowout loss in Philadelphia last Sunday ended with a loss in Milwaukee last night. What a big night this would be for Lonnie Walker, the fourth in Milwaukee, to close out this road trip with another set of back-to-back -back games. The Spurs started off hot, led by Walker's career-high 31 points. They included five three-pointers. The Spurs would build up as much as a 14-point first-half lead. DeMar DeRozan continued his return to the Spurs by playing in his second game, contributing another 22 points to the Spurs' cause to go along with his 13 assists. Keldon Johnson, another big night with 17 points, one of three starters in double figures. And Rudy Gay led the Spurs' reserves with 15 points off the bench. But playing without Patty Mills and Derek White in the second game of back-to-backs. The Bucks began their comeback in the second quarter by outscoring the Spurs 31-17, led by Giannis Antetokounmpo's 26 points and 15 assists. The Spurs got within four of Milwaukee in the fourth quarter on Walker's jumper to make it 98-94. But that's when the Bucks slammed the door on the Spurs. Chris Middleton delivered three big three-pointers down the stretch, and then Giannis with the exclamation mark, and the Spurs fall 120 to 113 as Milwaukee wins their season high sixth game in a row. We know that uh, we got a lot of room to improve. We got a lot of young guys, young pieces, and uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to say uh, where I, where our potential or where I certainly could be at because uh, we rarely had a, a full healthy team yet, and uh, we're getting everybody healthy and ready to go. So um, I feel like once once we hit our stride and uh, we make those improvements, I think we'll be in really good shape. We're a very young team, and we have guys like. Rudy and Demar, you know, great vets that keep us intact and, and keep us well disciplined. So um, we're only going to continue to get better. All right. After the game, Spurs head coach Greg Popovich, who is one win away from his 1300th victory, talked about why he decided not to play both Patty and Derek in the fifth game in the last seven nights. You know, a couple of important guys didn't play, uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, they all come to compete, uh, getting better all the time. And, you know, as I told him after the game, they have more room to improve than a lot of teams because they're still learning uh, an awful lot about what it takes to win and lose. I think DeMar and Rudy are doing a good job of uh, leading them. We had 29 assists tonight against a hell of a team. They do a great job. Uh, so we're, we're thrilled with the way we played. You just have to keep the consistency. Now, the Hornets played the Clippers in L.A. last night, 125-98. to Charlotte is currently ranked seventh in the Eastern Conference, but lost starting guard LaMelo Ball with a broken right wrist on this play. He will likely miss the rest of the season. The Hornets like to share the ball. In fact, they are ranked third in the league for assists per game at 27.1. They're also ranked in the top five for fast break points. The Spurs have already beaten the Hornets once this season. Here's a look at their schedule. Again, this nine next games will be at home, and here's a look at the schedule this week. Taking on Charlotte tomorrow at 7.30, then the Clippers back-to-back -back games on Wednesday and Thursday. Thursday on back-to-back -back nights, and they'll host the Chicago Bulls on Saturday at 7.30 in the AT&T Center. So at back-to-back -back games against the Clippers this week, this is what the Spurs are up against. L.A. currently holds the fourth seed in the West. The Clippers are ranked first in three-point and free-throw percentage. Their bench also scores 41 points per game. That's good for the top five in the NBA. San Antonio's already won against the Clippers once this season, but back in early January when the Clippers didn't have Paul George at the time. But even with George, L.A. has struggled over the last month, losing six of their last ten games. Kawhi has said publicly that he is concerned about the team's lack of consistency, which is funny because Kawhi left the Spurs four years ago, one of the most consistent teams in the league.
The Texas Longhorns were upset by Abilene Christian University in the first round of the NCAA tournament late last night. It's the first tournament victory ever for the Wildcats, who became tournament eligible in 2018. We call this a bracket buster since Abilene Christian was seeded 14th in Texas following their first ever Big 12 tournament championship was seeded third. The key to the Wildcats win was their defense after Texas led at the half by only 28 to 23, led by Andrew Jones, 13 points. The Wildcats outscored the Longhorns in the second half, 30 to 24, led by Joe Pleasants, only 11 points, forcing 23 turnover. Still, Jones gave Texas a lead with his three-pointer, 52-51 with 16 seconds to play, but Pleasant answers with a drive to the basket where he's fouled with 2.2 seconds left, and the notoriously bad free throw shooter at just 59% sinks both of them to get the Wildcats a lead, 53-52, and the biggest victory in school history. Extremely disappointing because uh, you know, we come into the seed, we, we earn a three seed, in the NCAA tournament, you know, I told the guys the other day, like, you guys don't understand how hard that is to do. Um, and we, and we've, we've earned that. Now, uh, we, we want to make the most of it, and we weren't able to do that. And so what's looking ahead here in the East region is Michigan LSU tomorrow at 610, Colorado and Florida State tomorrow at 645, Abilene Christian that now advances. They're taking on UCLA tomorrow at 425, Maryland against Alabama tomorrow at 745. And here's a look at the West region. Next up for Oklahoma and Gonzaga tomorrow at 140. Ohio and Creighton tomorrow at 510 p.m. Elsewhere, USC and Kansas will battle out tomorrow at 840. And the late game, or I should say an early game, I, I'm assuming that is, Oregon and Iowa, that is early at 1110 in the morning. Number one, Baylor is feeling sweet after taking care of number nine, Wisconsin, in the South region. Late first half, the Badgers turn it over. Maceo T gets it in for Baylor and feeds Mark Vitell for an alley-oop. Slam dunk, 36-24 Baylor. They led 42-29 at halftime. Wisconsin would get within seven in the second half, but the Bears pull away thanks to Matthew Mayer. A three put Baylor up 59-49. Mayer scored a team by 17 off the bench. Number one Baylor is into the Sweet 16 by the final score of 76-63. So let's take a look at the South region now that this has all happened. So Villanova would take on Baylor next after their victory today, Saturday. All these are to be announced right now. Oral Roberts would take on Arkansas also on Saturday as well. Early today, number eight Loyola of Chicago became the first team to knock off a number one seat and punch their ticket to the Sweet 16 by beating Illinois. The Ramblers dominate the majority of this game. Lucas Williamson drives and lays it in. Loyola of Chicago up by a dozen. Four minutes to play. Ramblers up nine. Now Cameron Crutwig gets the bucket and led the Ramblers with 19 points and 12 rebounds. And number eight Loyola of Chicago knocks off number one in the Midwest. Illinois 71 to 58. Sister Jean's prayers did indeed work. So in the Midwest, here's how we go ahead now. Loyola of Chicago still has to wait to find out who wins tonight. They're still playing now between Oklahoma State and Oregon State. That game would be on Saturday as well as Houston and Syracuse with those times to be announced as well. Time now for tonight's instant replay poll question. Should the Texas Longhorns fire Shaka Smart? Yes, 0-3 in the NCAA tournament. No, led Texas to the first Big 12 tournament title in school history. Vote now. We'll have the results at the end of the show tonight. We are just getting started with this edition of Instant Replay. Up next. Off the miss, rebound, and run. Look at the length of Smith and run. The women's NCAA basketball tournament tipped off today in San Antonio and the surrounding area, including Melissa Smith and the Baylor Bears. That's after it started with a controversy when teams began arriving in the Alamo City. A major disparity revealed in the weight rooms compared to the women's tournament and the men's tournament in Indianapolis. Who's to blame? Sports guys are back tonight with that debate, just that. And should as many as 60,000 fans be allowed to watch the next Canelo Alvarez fight? Find out when Instant Replay continues live next.